So chapter five is on the integumentary system. Um, if you guys want an exam review, please leave so. Let me know uh, in the comments below, and I'll uh, do my best to work on one for you. So when we're talking about the integumentary system, uh, the single largest organ that we have in our body is the skin. Uh, the skin, it's roughly, uh, it ranges from anywhere from 12 to 23 square feet. Uh, so just think about that, that that's enormous. Uh, it could be the size of a, you know, uh, somebody's bedroom. Uh, um, uh, as far as the weight goes, skin weighs anywhere between 9 to 11 pounds. Uh, that accounts for roughly about 7% of your, body, your, your uh, total body weight. Uh, in thickness, it varies anywhere from about one and a half millimeters to four millimeters or more, depending on uh, uh, which part of the body you're looking at. Um, in addition to skin, uh, uh, the hair, uh, nails, your sweat glands, and uh, um, oil glands, these are all part of the integumentary system. And the most, the number one important uh, job for the skin is to, uh, for protection. The skin, it's the first line of defense against uh, pathogens. So, you know, when you're out and about, you know, you're gardening, you're playing, uh, even when you're at home, again, we're surrounded by bacteria. And what prevents these bacteria from uh, entering the tissue uh, is the skin. This is the first line of defense. This is what keeps it out. Now, once the pathogen gets past that first line of defense, then at that point, then your secondary uh, defense system, it starts to kick in to try and isolate and neutralize uh, the pathogen. Uh, Hair, it does the same thing. The hair is there for protection. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, how the hair protects, but it, for, it serves uh, a few different uh, uh, functions. Uh, the same goes for the nails. Uh, your sweat glands, uh, of course, you know, it's uh, present to cool you. So when your body temperature goes up, your sweat glands, they cool you. Also, your sweat glands, they get rid of excess toxins. Um, and then we also have your oil glands. So the oil glands, they more or less, they, they, they nourish the skin. Uh, so without oil glands, uh, you know, your skin would be extremely dry. Um, so uh, again, uh, all these things, they're there to, uh, in, to protect the skin and they, they, they're working together uh, in unison to protect the entire organism. So your skin is made up of two distinct regions. You have the uppermost superficial region, which is called uh, the epidermis, and it's made up of mostly uh, keratinized, uh, keratinocytes. Uh, this type of tissue is avascular. It receives this uh, nourishment from the underlying tissue, uh, which is called the dermis. Uh, it's made up mostly of fibrous connective tissue. It is vascular. And within this dermis, this is where you're going to find all the, 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 the blood vessels here, uh, your, uh, the, the accessory structures in the skin. So we're, we're talking about uh, like your sweat glands, uh, your uh, oil glands, uh, hair follicles. This is all going to be found within the dermis. What's deep to the hypodermis, uh, to the dermis, is the hypodermis. Uh, this is uh, the subcutaneous layer. It's also referred to as the subcutaneous layer. Um, it's most, it's, it's fat. This is the, the, the fat layer of the skin. So, what does this adipose tissue mostly do? It's there to help support the, 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 the skin. Um, it uh, absorbs shock. It also uh, uh, insulates. In addition to insulating. Uh, this is also, you know, it's uh, this is where your body stores the extra energy uh, uh, in the form as adipose tissue. <clears throat> so again, when your body needs that that uh, you know energy and uh, the glucose supplies are, are depleted, then it's going to start burning the after actually after the glycogen is all depleted, it's going to start burning the, the the this adipose tissue, the fat. <clears throat> what the hypodermis do also does is that it anchors your skin to the underlying structures, which is mostly muscle. However, it's not very tightly anchored. So there, you know, and this is what gives a, 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 one of the abilities for, for, for skin to, uh, to kind of slip around. Um, and again, it, because it slips around, it makes it, more, it makes it more stronger. It makes it a little bit more resilient. So when you look at this picture over here, uh, what you're looking at is, uh, it's, this is the uppermost part of the skin called the epidermis. So look at where this, this uh, the epidermis starts. Again, so this is the part that you're able to see, you're able, able to touch from and it goes all the way down to this part that's going up and down, up and down. This is the border between the, uh, the epidermis and the underlying tissue, which is the dermis. Uh, so you do not, there's not much going on over here within the epidermis, okay? So remember, what do you have? It's primarily dead cells uh, uh, that you find over here. Uh, the living cells are over here, okay? You're gonna find the lower regions. 
uh, as they move upwards, they start to die out. Now, this is all connective tissue over here. And within this connective tissue, you fi find all the accessory structures uh, of the skin. So your hair follicles, for example, are found here. Um, your, uh, the, again, the, the hair root is over here. Then you have your uh, blood vessels that you find, uh, nerve, uh, uh, your nerve endings. Uh, in addition to that, you have uh, some muscles, which are called the erector pili muscles. These muscles, when they contract, is what gives uh, you know your skin uh, goosebumps. Okay, uh, pulls up your hair, makes it stand up. Also, um, so yeah, your uh, sweat glands are also found over here. Now, when you go deep to this uh, the dermis, then you have the fat layer, the subcutaneous layer. Okay, and it's all made up of, of adipose tissue, fat. Uh, so uh, the cells of the epidermis. It's made up mostly of keratinized uh, stratified squamous epithelium. So the four types of cells you find over here are, uh, one, uh, the, the first one we're going to be talking about are keratinocytes. Now the main job for keratinocytes is to pr produce the protein uh, keratin. And this gives, uh, keratin is what gives your skin its protective properties. Uh, it's the major cell of the epidermis. This is what you find mostly of, predominantly, Th this is it, these keratinocytes. They're very tightly connected to one another by desmosomes, and uh, they're constantly being replaced. Every day, you're constantly being replaced. Roughly anywhere from 25 to 45 days, you end up getting a brand new uh, uh, layer of skin on top. So daily, you know, the, these uh, skin cells are shedding off. Your body's constantly uh, producing uh, uh, these cells. The other type of cell you find are melanocytes. Now, melanocytes, they're a spider-shaped cell. And they're located in the, in the deepest uh, uh, part of your epidermis. And their main job is to produce the pigment melanin. Melanin is what gives your skin color. Uh, they get packaged into uh, uh, little uh, uh, granules called melanosomes. Now these melanosomes, uh, they get picked up by these keratinocytes. And then they, they go and, and, and they, uh, the, 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 uh, they end up shielding the upper part uh, of the nucleus of these keratinocytes. And what it's doing is it is protecting it from uh, the UV uh, uh, damage, ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So uh, again, these melanocytes are very, very, very important uh, to have this. Um, so what stimulates these melanocytes is to start producing more and more melanin. Uh, well, a couple of different things. One is genetic, uh, your genes. Uh, so depending on you know, your race, your body produces high amounts of this or you know, it's going to produce uh, not too much of it. So if you're European, then your body doesn't produce too much of these melanocytes. But if you're, if you're African or Asian, uh, then or you know, uh, uh, certain parts of uh, African and Asian, let's keep it over there at, at this point, uh, your body is going to produce uh, different, uh, different amounts of it. It's going to pr produce uh, much more uh, than uh, uh, the Europeans, but less than the Africans. Uh, so uh, these uh, melanocytes again super important. So when people are essentially when they're going out and, and uh, you know you're laying underneath the sun, essentially what you're doing is you're exposing your body to this UV light, uh, this which is the sun, and that sun, that UV light is stimulates these melanocytes to start producing more and more melanin. Your body's like whoa, a lot of damaging stuff is coming on to us. We have to protect ourselves. So we make a lot more melanin, and that's you know your body's gonna make more. In the winter months, when you're not, uh, you know, when your your skin is covered and you know, it's protected from uh, the, the the sun, then your body, these uh, uh, melanocytes, they have no reason to produce these higher amounts, so they don't produce that much. So that's why your skin it tends to be lighter in the in the in the winter years, especially when you're living in in uh, cold cities like uh, uh, Minnesota, uh, uh, Minneapolis, uh, in Illinois, in Chicago, uh, in uh, Michigan, in Detroit. Uh, so again, these colder regions where you're, you're, you're covered mostly, um, your body does not produce that much uh, melanin. But then you go down to places and people that live in, in the warmer climates, uh, you know, they're much more darker because, you know, they're, they're usually wearing short uh, t-shirts, uh, short sleeve shirts, shorts. So, you know, you're going to have a, a higher amount of melanocytes produced. The, the other type of cells we have are these dendritic cells, which are also sometimes called Langerhans cells. These are a star-shaped they're uh, a protective cell uh, in the body. Uh, they're associated with macrophages. And they are there to protect uh, your epidermis, okay? The deeper parts of the epidermis. Uh, they come from the, your bone marrow, and they end up moving, they produce there, they end up moving up to uh, your, 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 the epidermis. Uh, they are 
key activators for your immune system. Researchers are still looking at this to how these Langerhans cells, they also respond to uh, UV damage in, the, in, in, the, in what role they have or and how they, they, they combat skin cancers also. Uh, the other type of cells we find are these tactile cells, which are also referred to as Merkel cells. And these cells are, uh, are, are uh, they're sensor receptors that allow you to feel the sensation of touch. So there we have it. Those are the four types of cells that we have. Now, the epidermis, uh, even though it is the, the, you know, the thinnest part of the skin, it's made up of five or depending or, f or five uh, distinct regions. And it's either four or five depending on which part of the body you're looking at. Uh, so, for example, uh, the, your, the, the parts of your body where there's going to be a lot of friction, like uh, the soles of your ha uh, hands and soles of your feet, uh, this area you're going to find uh, thick skin over here. Uh, so thick skin, it has this additional strata. So th these layers are also referred to as strata. Now the thin skin, it's, gonna, it's only going to have four layers or four strata there. So uh, these are the five layers uh, of your skin or the five strata going from deep to the uppermost layer, okay, or most superficial. So the very first layer is called the, uh, is the stratum basale. Um, so this is the deepest part of the skin, and this is where the germ layer is found, or it's also referred to as the stratum germinativum. Uh, we'll be looking at that in the next few slides for all these, uh, th these regions. Uh, but the next region above it is the stratum spinosium. After that, you have the stratum granulosum. Then comes the stratum lucidium. This you will only find in these thick, um, the, the thick parts of your skin. Uh, superficial to the stratum lucidium, you know, then you're going to have your stratum corneum, and this is the uppermost layer of your of your uh, uh, your skin, your epidermis. So let's look at the the very first layer now, the stratum basale. So this is the deepest part of your skin. Uh, it's the base layer, and as like I said earlier, it's also sometimes referred to as the stratum germinativum, uh, because it's the most active part. This is where all the, the cells are, are being born and, and being pushed up from. So it's highly mitotic uh, over here. It's a very high, it's a highly mit mitotic layer. Uh, it's, this is also the layer that's attached to the underlying tissue, the dermis. And it's made up of a single uh, row of uh, stem cells uh, that again, that are constantly dividing, okay, by mitosis to produce two daughter cells. Uh, and it takes roughly 25 to 45 days for these cells to migrate uh, uh, all the way to the top. So as the cells are moving upwards from the, uh, the, the base layer, they start to die off for, for a handful of reasons. And we'll, we'll look at, at that as, as the next uh, in the next slides to come. Uh, anywhere from 10 to 25% of this layer is also made up of these um, um, melanocytes. Okay, so remember what we said, these melanocytes, we find them in the, in the deepest layer of the skin. Now the stratum spinosium, it's also referred to as, as a prickly layer. Uh, it's several cell layers thick, uh, and they contain cells that kind of form like a web-like system of, of, uh, uh, of these uh, pre-keratin filaments that are attached to the desmosomes. And what this does is it allows uh, them uh, to resist tension and pulling. So keratinocytes in this layer, they look spicy, uh, spiky. So uh, not spicy, but spiky. Uh, so then sometimes they're also referred to as these prickle cells. Uh, they're scattered among the keratinocytes, and they're abundant in the melanosome and dendritic cells also. So the next layer is the stratum granulosum, and it's uh, four to uh, six cell, uh, cells thick. Uh, the cells, what happens is, is, is that they start to flatten out, so it is a thin layer. Now, uh, because of the, the cells are starting to flatten out, some changes are, that means some changes are taking place within the cell. So we refer to this as the transitional uh, uh, stratum, the transitional layer. So the cell appearance that's changing place is uh, happening because the cells are starting to flatten up. The nuclei and organelles are starting to disintegrate also. What's happening is that the cells are uh, they're starting to undergo keratinization. Uh, this, the, the cells accumulate two types of granules. Uh, the first is uh, the, the keratohyaline, and this helps form uh, the keratin fibers in the upper layers of the cell uh, later on as the cell continues to move upwards. The cells they also accumulate the lamellar granules, and this uh, uh, the lamellar gr granules is what uh, it's it's waterproof, okay? So it's water resistant, and it slows down the water loss. Uh, the cells above this layer uh, they die. So after this, the cells are dead, and the reason uh, that this is happening is uh, again the, the because the cell the shape is taking place, but also because the cells are moving uh, very far away from the dermis. 
Now keep in mind, remember, there's no blood vessels that are that we find in the, the epidermis. All the nutrition that the cell needs comes from the underlying uh, tissue, the dermis. That's where the blood vessels are located. So as you're moving out further away, away from the, uh, uh, higher up, away from the, uh, the, the dermis, where the blood supply is, the cells, they receive less and less nu nutrients. So by the time that they're up over here, they get to the stratum granulosum, this is going to be it, okay? After this point, there's no more nutrition. The, they're not going to be able to get what they need. So this is when they start to die out at the, after this point. So again, another reason why we call this a transitional layer because the cells are in the die, you know, they're they're in their death process. They're they're about to die now. Now, the next layer, this is called the stratum lucidium. It's also re re referred to to as the the clear la uh, layer, and uh, remember this layer is only found in the thick parts of the skin. So again, we're talking about your the the, the palms of your 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 hand and the soles of your feet. Uh, where the skin is thick, where you have a lot of friction taking place, this is where you're going to find this. And it's made up of, a, of a, 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 a thin translucent band of roughly anywhere from two to three rows of clear uh, dead keratinocytes. Uh, again, it lies right on top of the stratum granulosum and it lies uh, deep to the next layer, which, which is the stratum corneum, or the, the layer that appears to be uh, horny. Uh, this is roughly 20 to 30 rows of flat, dead cells. Again, they're anucleated. Remember, in the previous, in the, in the stratum granulosum, the nucleus disintegrates, as well as the organelles. So what do you have? you got dead cells over here. And this makes up more than uh, three quarters of your uh, uh, epidermis. Okay? The thickness of your epidermis is it, it's fr from these dead cells, the stratum corneum. This is what you're touching, guys. Uh, this is what you're seeing. Uh, this is what makes you know you beautiful. If you're talking about beautiful skin, are these dead cells? Uh, even though though they're dead, these are the, the, the tough cells. Okay, they're still functional. And what is their job? Remember, their job is to uh, protect, to act as a barrier from the outside environment uh, to the inside environment. So they're protecting the deeper cells. Okay, from all the the, the pathogens and all the other uh, uh, hazards that are, are present. Uh, it prevents the water loss also. It protects you from abrasions and other type of penetrations Again, in addition to acting as a, a barrier against all disease causing uh, microorganisms. So bacteria, uh, fungus, uh, 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 viruses, uh, in addition to biological and to, to chemical and other type of uh, uh, physical trauma. So cell changes, okay, cells change by going through apoptosis. So apoptosis is just another no, fancy word for cellular death, okay? So this, when the cell is dying uh, or, you know, uh, committing suicide, I think another term to look at, that's called apoptosis. Uh, so dead cells, uh, they slow up as dandruff and dander. Uh, so in humans, we shed roughly 50,000 cells every minute. That's, that's uh, again, amazing. Now, you don't see it happen again. These are... They're invisible cells. Now, if you don't take a shower for a few days, uh, and you know, especially in the winter time where you're sweating a lot, or you know, you're out, you're playing, uh, you get really dirty, and then you know, you end up taking a shower for after three days, four days, whatever, uh, and then you know, when if you look at uh, your your tub, you'll see a lot of uh, that scum that, that you see on the on the that stuck to the, the tiles. Now, that's a lot of the dead cells. Okay, that's just a lot of dead cells that you know that you just washed off. Uh, so again, this is another reason why you want to shower every, or daily is to help, uh, you know, to get rid of all these uh, dead cells off your skin. So it's, it's quite interesting, you know, 50,000 cells every minute. Uh, you know, that uh, roughly that equates to about 40 pounds of uh, cells in a person's lifetime. Uh, again, it's a, it's a significant number. So when you're looking at this, uh, the, this picture here, the, this slide here, and this uh, illustration here, we're looking at the epidermis. So uh, let's look at the very, again, now let's go from, from uh, superficial to deep. So from here all the way to over here, okay, uh, these are, this is the stratum corneum. So this is roughly 30 layers of dead cells, all right? Uh, and this is what's providing all this other tissue underneath, all these other cells underneath, this is what's protecting that and, you know, everything else uh, underwards, uh, including the dermis and the rest of your body. This primarily is, or well, this whole area, this entire region is the first line of defense. Uh, for your body. Uh, 
when you go deep to the stratum corneum, then you have the stratum granulosum. Oh, so by the way, this is gonna be in th thin skin. Now remember, in thick skin, you're gonna have another layer right over here, uh, the stratum lucidium, which is clear, and that's roughly, again, probably about a few cell layers thick uh, of cells that you'll find over here. And that you're only gonna find in like your, uh, again, in the thick parts of your skin, so you're talking about your, your, the soles of your feet and the palms of your hand. Um, so now let's look at this layer, the stratum granulosum. Now notice what happens over here uh, at this layer compared to the cells below. Notice that they're starting to flatten out. They're really starting to flatten out right, right, right around here. So after this layer, the cells are, you know, they, they die. So they're still, you know, they're in the, in the death process uh, in this layer, in this, uh, the stratum granulosum. Then when you go deep to that, then you have the stratum spinosium over here. Uh, and then uh, deep to that, then you have your stratum basale. Uh, or the basal layer, the stratum uh, 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 germinatavia. Uh, so when you look over here, notice that what you find, the type of cells. So you have these tactile cells over here, or the Merkel cells, they're also called. Uh, you have your melanocytes that you find here. And then also, uh, there'll be the, dren the dendritic cells. Uh, again, which are also sometimes called the, uh, the, the Langerhan cells. So this is it for the top part of your skin, your epidermis, um, as far as, you know, how, what it looks like. So deep to the epidermis, you have the dermis. And the dermis is its strong, flexible, connective tissue. Uh, the cells that you find over here, it's, uh, they include the fibroblasts, macrophages, and you also occasionally find mast cells and white blood cells over here. Uh, the fibers in this matrix is what binds your body together. So it makes up kind of like a hide that, you, that, that we use to, to make, uh, make leather. Um, you're gonna find nerves over here, blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, uh, in addition to uh, uh, the hair follicles, oil glands, and sweat glands. Now the dermis is made up of two, uh, two regions, or it's, it's, it, yeah, it consists of two main regions. You have uh, the upper papillary region, which is about 20% of the dermis, and then you have a thicker reticular region, which is about 80% uh, of, the, of the dermis. So when you're looking over here, uh, what we're looking at is both the epidermis as well as the dermis. So from here, to over here, the, what you have is the epidermis. So this is the stratum basale, and then all the way over here, this is the uppermost part, the stratum uh, corneum. Now when you go deep to the, the epidermis, now you have your, your dermis. So from here, down here, this is all the dermis. Now this upper part over here, this is the papillary uh, layer. So going from here to roughly right around here, this is the, the papillary region. Now when you go deep to that, the bulk of this so r roughly from here on downwards, this is all uh, the, your reticular region. Uh, so whereas over here, you have uh, uh, loose areolar connective tissue. Over here, you're going to have um, uh, dense uh, connective tissue, dense uh, uh, irregular connective tissue. So the papillary layer, uh, so this is a superficial part of uh, the, the connective tissue and it, it's uh, like I said mentioned earlier it's made up of a, lo a loose areolar connective tissue um, so you're gonna have collagen over here elastic fibers and blood vessels you'll find them also uh, the, the smaller uh, capillaries of the blood vessels you're gonna end up seeing them here uh, the loose fibers they allow for uh, the white blood cells and the phagocytes uh, to patrol this area for microorganisms uh, also over here you're gonna find these dermal papillae so this is a superficial region of the dermis and it sends up these finger line projections up into the epidermis. Now these projections is what actually contains these capillary loops. Uh, and in addition to that, you're gonna find these uh, free nerve endings, so your, uh, for, for your, uh, uh, that make up the, uh, your, your uh, what, what are called Meissner's corpuscles uh, or the touch receptors. So uh, in thick skin now, uh, the dermal papillae, they lie on top of these dermal ridges. And these dermal ridges, they give right, rise to the epidermal ridges. And uh, collectively, these ridges are referred to as the friction ridges. And what they do, so when you look at the palms of your hands, uh, and uh, they, uh, they provide uh, the, you with the grip. Okay, so they enhance the ability to grip things. And they also help contribute to uh, uh, touch sensations. Uh, your sweat pores, in ridges, they leave these unique fingerprint patterns that you have, okay? So when you look over here, uh, these are, so you're looking at a finger over here, and this is your fingerprint. 
So uh, the openings in sweat, sweat glands, you'll, you'll find them over here also. And so these the, the, are the friction ridges. And what do they do? They help provide grip. Okay, that, that's why you have these on, on your finger. So imagine if you're, for example, you know, you, you're, if you uh, put on some gloves, okay, like a really thin pair of gloves, smooth gloves, uh, are you able to, to count uh, your, your money with that, you know, your dollar bills if you're trying to, you know, uh, count them one, two, three, four, five? Uh, it's very difficult. Why? Because you cannot get a grip. But when you look at your finger, because of these uh, ridges that you have, uh, you're able to separate and, and you know, each one of these individual banknotes um, and, and count them. Uh, so, uh, yes, reticular region, 80%. Uh, uh, it, it makes up 80% of your uh, the, the thickness of your dermis. Uh, it's made up of dense, fibrous, uh, irregular connective tissue. You're going to find uh, many elastic fibers here, and this elastic fiber is what gives the, the, the skin the ability to stretch and recoil. Collagen fibers also you're going to find over here, and they help strengthen and provide resilience uh, to the dermis. Um, it also uh, helps bind water and this, uh, keeping the skin stay hydrated. Uh, the extracellular matrix uh, it's made up of uh, adipose t uh, cells. Uh, so you find a handful of fat cells over here also. But remember, the underlying tissue is where you're going to have uh, the hypodermis. That's where all the fat cells are. But over here, you find a handful as well. Um, within the reticular layer, knowledge of the uh, cleavage lines is very important to uh, the surgeons. If you have a good knowledge of how these cleavage, where they are and how they run, and when they're sewing up, you can provide uh, a, you you can pretty much uh, eliminate scars. Okay, if you end up stitching, closing uh, uh, in in parallel to these lines. Uh, so again, uh, these cleavage lines in reticular layers they're caused by many collagen fibers that are running parallel to the surface of the skin. Uh, you cannot see them externally, but as I said earlier, uh, to the surgeon. That's making a cut. If he knows how these lines are, are running and he makes an incision that's parallel to these lines, you're going to get less scar tissue for, that, that's going to form. So if you look over here, these are where these cleavage lines are. All right? So again, uh, if you're a surgeon, you don't want to cut like this. All right? Instead, you want to cut, make an incision running parallel to these lines. When you do that, the skin is going to heal faster, less scarring. So flexure lines uh, of reticular layers are dermal folds that we find at or near joints. So what happens over here is that the dermis, it gets very tightly secured to the deeper structures. Uh, you're going to find this at on uh, your hands, your wrists, uh, the, the, your soles, uh, your, your toes. Um, so wherever you have, uh, uh, again, your major joints, this is where, where you're going to find them at. Uh, so uh, the skin's ability to slide easily uh, for joint movement, it's not there. So because it's not there, because it's very tight there now, this is what causes these deep creases uh, at these uh, parts of the skin. So when you look at your, look, just look at your palms for a minute and no, no, notice the creases on each one of your fingers. So whenever you're, when you're flexing your fingers, notice what happens to those creases. They deepen more and more and more, uh, 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 more. And again, because of, uh, uh, now if you didn't have that, what would happen is that your skin would would hang loose. Okay, it wouldn't be that uh, uh, you would lose uh, grip. You would lose the traction over there. So again, at these joints, you're gonna have the skin that gets uh, deeply anchored to the underlying structures. So right over here, this is what we're talking about. Look at these flexure lines that you see over here. Again, over here at your palms. So wherever you know you, you have a lot of uh, um, major joints, and you know you have a lot of motion. You're gonna find these same thing, you know, uh, where your uh, the the front part of your uh, or the back part of your knees. Okay, you're gonna have the, you'll see them over there as well. So extreme uh, stretching of skin causes these dermal tears, uh, and then it ends up leading uh, scars that are called striae. Uh, the common uh, term for this are these stretch marks. So uh, you'll send you'll tend to see these in people that you know that gain so much weight. Okay, if, if you end up being obese and then you end up losing. Weight, the weight, you see this. Uh, same time uh, when women uh, gets pregnant. So, you know, uh, what happens when the woman gets pregnant, the, the, as the fetus grows, uh, the abdomen stretches out more and more and more. 
as th that you know, uh, as your belly gets bigger and bigger, the skin starts getting pushed out as well. Um, so again, this would cause these stretch marks. Uh, so short-term traumas to the skin can cause blisters. So blisters, uh, they're just um, fluid-filled pockets that separate the epidermis from the deeper dermal layers. So if you look over here, the, the, this is, these are the stretch marks, striae as they're called. So skin color. Three pigments contribute to skin color. The first of them is melanin. So this is, melanin is the only pigment that's made in skin. And it's made up by melanocytes, as we learned earlier on in, in the lecture. Uh, the melanocytes, uh, they uh, produce the melanin. The melanin gets packaged into um, uh, granules called mel uh, melanosomes. Uh, and then uh, they are sent to the keratinocytes to shield the upper part of the nucleus from the DNA. Uh, for, uh, to, to shield the upper part of the, the nucleus from the sunlight to pr prevent the DNA from getting damaged. Uh, the exposure to the sun is what stimulates the melanocytes to produce more and more melanin. Uh, it comes in a, a two different shades. There's a, a reddish to yellow color and then there's also a brownish to black color. So uh, all humans, we all have the same number of melanocytes. Uh, there's an error over here. I shouldn't say keratinocytes, uh, melanocytes. So the, the, the color differences, uh, they're due to this amount of melanin that are uh, produced by these melanocytes. Now, when you, now this happens for a, hand, a couple of different reasons. As I mentioned earlier, uh, one of them is genetics, okay, and the other is, uh, uh, aside from genetics, is your amount of exposure to the sun. Generally speaking, people that are closer to the equator, they're going to be, t they tend to be uh, much darker in skin. People that are further away from the equator, they tend to be uh, uh, lighter in skin. So again, uh, people that are li living in the warmer parts of the country, uh, of the world, you're going to see them being uh, more pigmented. And when you look at the Europeans, uh, they live in cold parts of the world. Uh, you know, most of the, the, the year it's cold in those countries. Uh, and when, because it's cold over there, you know, they're not walking around uh, with uh, their, their bodies exposed to the sun. And by that, I'm, what I'm saying is they have on, uh, you know, long sleeves shirts, they're wearing sweaters, uh, they have on, uh, you know, uh, coats on top of that. Same thing with their pants, they might have a couple of layers on, on the uh, under uh, their legs. Uh, so again, they have all this uh, protection. It's, it shields those uh, melanocytes, or the, 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 yeah, the melanocytes from being stimulated to produce uh, the melanin. Now, uh, on the opposite end, you know, when people are living in these really warm tropical environments, uh, and not even tropical, in, in desert environments, for example, uh, a lot of sun that's being produced, so they're not in these thick layers, so all that sun that's uh, th that they're being hit uh, hit by causes melanocytes to produce more and more melanin. Um, now freckles, uh, these are just molds that are frozen. Okay, so they're just frozen melanocytes. That's what freckles are. Keratin. This is the other pigment that gives uh, skin color. So keratin is like a yellow to orange pigment, and you know, uh, so you know, if you eat a lot of uh, uh, carrots, they're high in uh, keratin. So uh, if you eat lots and lots and lots and lots of car carrots, for example, uh, you'll notice that you know the, the first places that you'll see are your palms and soles. They start to take on a, a more of a, a like a orange, uh, y yellow to orange uh, color change. Uh, so it, the keratin it starts to accumulate uh, in, in the top, okay, the stratum corn uh, corneum, as well as in the hypodermis. Uh, the good thing about keratin is that it can be converted to vitamin A. And vitamin A, as you guys know, it's good for vision. Uh, and vi vitamin A is also very good for uh, uh, epidermal skin uh, skin health. So if you notice a lot of these uh, uh, moisturizers that are out there, they will say, you know, it's fortified with vitamin A. Hemoglobin. Now, this is, remember, uh, this is the part of your red blood cell, okay? The protein part of your, uh, the, 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 uh, your red blood cell. So the globin, this is the... The protein part of your red blood cell, the heme, this is the iron portion. See, hemoglobin also gives like this pink, uh, uh, a pinkish hue uh, that's easily visible on people with fair skin. Uh, so again, when you look at Europeans, and you know, because the, what makes their skin look red is the hemoglobin, it's the blood. It's the lack of melanocytes they have, but the blood that's, you know, it's, it's moving throughout their body and the capillary beds is what gives them uh, this uh, this pinkish uh, hue to, the, to their to their skin. Uh, 
So too much skin ex exposure, excessive sun exposure uh, damages the skin. The sun is bad, guys. Okay, uh, excessive sun, sun is bad. You know, if you go about more, you don't need more than ten minutes of day, uh, ten minutes of sun a day. Get exposed to about ten minutes of sun to the day. Your body's got enough. It, that's enough for it to produce the vitamin D that it needs. Uh, you're, you're all good. Um, so. When you look at people that you know that love to sunbathe, okay, they're out there every single day uh, under the sun. They have no sun protection on, and they've been doing this, you know, for year after year after year after year. What happens is this: look at their skin. Look how horrible it looks. Uh, the elastic fibers they start to, to clump up together, and now their skin looks leathery. It doesn't look so beautiful anymore, does it? Uh, it also depresses your immune system, and it alters the DNA. Again, sunlight is radio. It's, it's radiation, okay. And that leads to skin cancers. So usually, uh, generally speaking, if a person, uh, most of the, scun, the, 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 the sun damage that people end up getting later on in life, it happens earlier on in their life. So up until your teen years, all that sun that you've been soaking up, uh, it's going to cause damages, you know, into your 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, you know, and, and beyond. Um, and then, you know, of course, you know, after that age, 20, 30, 40, 50, uh, as you're getting more and more sun, it's going to continue to damage. But the bulk of it happens earlier on. Uh, ultraviolet light, it destroys folic acid also. And you need this, okay? It's uh, necessary for DNA synthesis. So insufficient folic acid is especially dangerous for developing embryos. Uh, so uh, one of the things that, you, that you'll notice in women that are pregnant, they're taking these multivitamins, you know, it'll have, uh, it'll, that'll be one of the key selling points, high in folic acid, it will say. Um, photosensitivity is increased to uh, is increased reaction to sun. That's what. So when you look at it, photo means light sensitive. So you're expo uh, you're uh, sensitive to light. Uh, so some drugs like antibiotics and antihistamines, they'll say you know don't go under the sun. So like if you're taking a for example a, a minocycline, uh, it'll say you know avoid going under underneath the sun. So minocycline, a lot of young people will take it uh, to, to to deal with acne. Um, uh, some perfumes that can cause photosensitivity as well uh, and then you end up getting these rashes uh, on your skin so the skin can tell you can tell uh, say a lot about a person's overall general health um, so one of the things uh, is when somebody appears to be cyanotic okay or cyanosis as the word says that's when the skin starts looking blue cyan means blue so when your oxygen levels are low uh, then you know uh, the skin starts ap appearing a, uh, a bluish color, uh, and it's th this is very easy to see in, in people of fair skin. Uh, and individuals with uh, with uh, darker skin is a little bit hard to notice. Uh, also, when there is redness in the skin, okay, erythema, uh, this will indicate that a person has uh, fever, okay, or hyper. There they might be hypertensive or some type of an inflammation or an allergic response is going on in their body. Other times, you'll notice that a person m might be pale in color, okay? And that's referred to as being pallor. So individuals that are anemic or when their blood pressure falls down too low. Uh, or again, if they get uh, really scared, this is when this will happen. Uh, when the, there's problems with your liver, okay, your skin will look very yellow. The, eyes, the white part of your eyes will appear yellow as well. And that's referred to as jaundice. When you start to see the skin and it is looking, uh, it's uh, in bronze in color. Okay, there's bronzing. This this means that you, uh, there's an inadequate uh, steroid hormones in, in the individual. So Addison's disease is an example of that. Uh, other times you'll see bruising. Okay, black and blue marks. So when you see bruising, a person could have gotten beat up or hit by something. They might there, there there may have been some trauma that was caused. Uh, and what's that is just blood that's trapped underneath the skin, okay, clotted blood. Now hair, we're going to be talking about. So hair is made up of dead, keratinized cells. Uh, so these are all dead cells, guys, okay? Everything that you see on your skin, your nails, uh, you know, the, the your beautiful skin, uh, your hair, these are all dead cells. Um, you don't find hair, hair is found all over your body, okay? The exceptions being the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet, your lips, uh, the nipples, and parts of the external genitalia. Uh, they lack hair completely. Now, what's the function of hair? Why do we have hair? Well, one of the things is 
uh, hair, it protects you from sunlight. So the reason you have hair on your head is to protect it from sunlight. If you notice that people that, that have no hair, uh, that, that, that are bald, uh, and in the summertime especially, if they don't have a hat on, you'll see that they're, 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 uh, they're, they're, the, the scalp ends up getting burnt. Okay, and you, you, you'll notice a lot of skin damage occurring over there. So it's important for these individuals to, to wear a UV protected uh, baseball cap um, or some type of a hat to, to, uh, to, to cover their scalp. Also, uh, hair. Uh, think about the hair on your arms. In the summertime, again, when you're sitting outside and a fly lands on you, as that fly is moving through, uh, it's walking and it disrupts these uh, hair follic uh, the, your hair follicles, then you find it provides you sensation. And, you know, you're able to, you know, uh, kill that or, you know, just uh, uh, s s s uh, scare that fly off of you. Uh, in addition to that, hair also uh, acts as a guard. So, for example, uh, it traps things. So, you know, I just gave you the example of a hair, uh, of the fly. So, you know, before the fly can actually get onto the skin, if you're really hairy, for example, the fly is going to line on that hair. And before it touches your skin, uh, then, you know, it, again, your hair is going to alert you that uh, something landed on it, and then you can, you know, scare it away. Uh, same thing when you look at uh, the hair that you find in your nose, for example. They act as filters, okay, and they're filtering particles out uh, that you're breathing into. Same thing for the, the hair in your ear. It helps protect, keep out uh, insects, for example, and also it helps traps debris. Uh, of course, uh, uh, hair also protects from heat loss. Uh, again, when you look at uh, animals, for, uh, for example, a cat or a dog or bear, they have a ton of hair, they're completely surrounded. So their hair, you know, not only is that close for them, but at the same time, it's keeping them warm. It helps trap their body heat. That's why in the summer months, uh, usually, uh, again, especially if you have a, a cat or a dog uh, in, in, a, at home, you'll see that they start shedding a lot. And they're shedding this excess hair in, in anticipation of the warmer weather. Another term for hair uh, uh, that they use is pili. So again, they're flexible strands of dead keratinized cells. They're produced by hair follicles. Uh, and the keratin that they have is hard. Okay, it's much harder than, the, uh, than that, on your, uh, that you have on your skin. So that's where it's different, but it's still keratin nonetheless. The hard keratin is tougher and is more durable. The cells, they don't flake off on this. Um, now there's different regions uh, of that hair. Uh, there's a shaft and that's the area that's uh, above the scalp. That's what you're able to see, touch and comb, this, uh, the, the, the shaft. The root is a part that you don't see. Okay, so it's located within the scalp. Uh, this is where keratinization is still going on, where it's taking place. Now, three parts of the hair shaft. You have the medulla, and this is the core of large cells and air spaces uh, of that, uh, the, 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 the hair. Then there's a cortex, okay? Now, this is a part of the shaft. Uh, it's uh, several layers of flat cells that surround the medulla. Finally, you have a cuticle, and this is the outermost layer. So this is the outer layer that's consisting of overlapping layers of single cells. Uh, hair pigments, they're also made by melanocytes, okay? Uh, now, these melanocytes are found within the hair follicles. Now, the combination of different melanins, yellow, uh, rust, brown, black, it creates all the, uh, the, the colors that we see in hair. Uh, red hair has an addition of uh, a pigment called pheomelanin. Gray and white hair results when the melanin uh, production, it starts to decrease and you end up getting ear bubbles that replace the melanin in the shaft. So when you look over here in, in this, uh, this diagram, so what you're looking at, first of all, this is a, a, a cross section. Now, uh, this part over here, this is the outermost part over here. So this is what you have, what we call the cuticle, all right? The cortex is gonna be over here, and the medulla, this is gonna be the innermost part. Don't forget, remember, the center is the medulla, okay? You got a lot, lot of cells over there, some air spaces also. Then you move outwards, then you got uh, many layers of cells over here uh, that make up the cortex. And then finally, you have a single layer of cells that make up this outer cortex. So this is what that uh, the hair shaft is made up of. So uh, the, the hair follicle, it extends uh, fr from the epidermal surface of the skin to the dermis, it's roughly four millimeters. The hair bulb, uh, this is an expanded area at the deep end of the follicle. Now, the hair follicle receptor is sometimes called the root hair plexus. This is where the sensory nerve endings that wrap around the bulb. And this is what, uh, why the hair is considered to be a, a sensory uh, touch receptor. 
the wall of the follicle is made up of a, a peripheral connective a tissue sheath uh, that's derived from the dermis and it's also uh, uh, called a, a fibrous sheath. Uh, you also see a glassy membrane and this is just a th thickened basal lamina. Uh, also you'll find uh, the, the follicle uh, is made up of uh, an epithelial root sheath and this is derived from the epidermis. Now the hair matrix, this is the actively dividing area of the bulb. This is what makes the hair cell. This is how hair grows. Is from this hair matrix. So as the matrix produces new cells, the older cells get pushed forward. So everything that you see, these dead cells, uh, the reason that they're growing is because of this matrix producing more and more cells. As they produce more cells, the older get cells, the dead ones, they start to get pushed outwards. Now also associated with uh, a hair follicle are these erectile pili. So these are small bands of smooth muscles uh, and they're attached to the follicle. So when you get goosebumps and your hair stands up, it's these erectile pili muscles that are uh, that are contracting, uh, that causes the, the the skin to you know to, to to tighten up and then also for for these, the hair to stand up. Uh, now also you'll find these hair papilla and it's dermal tissue uh, that has knots of capillaries and this is what supplies uh, this is the blood supply okay and that, this is what nourishes that growing hair. So when you look over here, this longitudinal view. Uh, uh, of a hair follicle. So notice this, first of all, this is the, you're looking at the bulb, okay? This is the hair bulb. And this is under, the part that's underneath uh, the, the, the epidermis. Notice what do you have here? You have adipose tissue, all right? So essentially, when you look over here, uh, let's, let's start off, we'll go inwards. This is the medulla. Remember we said about the innermost medulla, then you have the outer cortex, and then we said, what do we, what do we have? We have, uh, after the cortex, we had a, a single layer of cells that make up the, the cuticle. So this is here, right right over there. Okay, so you can remember, cuticle, cortex, inner medulla over there. Now, let's look at this region over here, okay? So uh, this part over here is the internal root sheath. Then this is the external root sheath, all right? After the external root sheet, you have this glassy membrane. And then after the glassy membrane, you have this peripheral uh, connective tissue the, or the fibrous sheet that we have. All right, so this is it. And then notice that uh, this is where these melanocytes are found over here. And then this is where that hair papilla is. So this is how uh, 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 the, the nourishment with the blood vessels and stuff, this is how the, the, this uh, hair is getting its uh, nutrients from. All right, so you might have a, uh, a diagram like this on an exam, so you make sure you, you, you know the different parts of, uh, of the hair. The types and growth of hair. Um, vellus hair, this is a fine, uh, a, a very fine body hair. It's usually pale, and you find this in children and also in, 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 uh, in uh, adult uh, women. Terminal hair, this is coarse, long hair, and you find this in your, uh, your scalp, and your eyebrows, and then also at puberty, you'll see it in, under the axillary region and the pubic regions in both uh, males and females. Uh, in men, you're going to find it also on the face as well as the, the neck. Uh, now, nutrition and hormones, they affect hair growth also. In men, uh, sex hormones, they uh, stimulate uh, the, 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 the growth of uh, hormones in, in the face and in the chest. Uh, again, uh, in, um, also nutrition, again, if you're eating a good diet and you're eating a diet that's high in, in, uh, uh, in, in vitamins, uh, then you know your hair health will be good as well. Um, now, hair follicles, they cycle between active and reg regressive fa phases. Uh, on average, your hair will grow about two and a quarter millimeters uh, per week. Uh, you lose roughly 90 uh, hairs from your scalp a day. Now, going back to these active and regressive phases, there's three phases that hair goes through. There's uh, uh, an anagen, uh, a catagen, and uh, a telogen phase. Now, uh, the growing phase, okay, the, this, uh, uh, the anagen phase, it can last for, again, it depends on which type of hair you're looking at, which part of the body. If you're looking at eyebrow hair, your scalp hair, uh, or you know the hair that you have in your arms, uh, it depends on the hair. But uh, the, the growing phase, it could be for a few weeks to years, okay? 
Then this catagen phase, this usually lasts about a few weeks, all right, between two to three weeks. And this is a stage right before the hair is about to rest. Okay, that's called the catagen. Then there's a telogen phase. The telogen phase is the resting phase. And this is about three months, okay? The hair is, you know, it's, it's doing nothing, it's dormant, all right? So three months, this is the resting phase. Uh, it's usually about that long, between two to three months. After that, again, the, 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 the growing phase starts uh, back up. Now, in women, uh, ovaries and adrenal glands, they produce small amounts of androgens uh, also, the male sex hormones. Uh, and again, and this is what causes in men, you know, the hair on the, on the chest and the facial hair. Uh, but sometimes... Uh, tumors that you get on uh, adrenal glands uh, or uh, you, the the uh, the, uh, the 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 ovaries uh, they will cause uh, uh, the, uh, this access of hair growth okay in areas that you don't want it so this when this happens uh, this is called hirsutism uh, so the way to treat this is by having the tumor removed okay it's uh, it's as simple as that. So alopecia, uh, this is hair thinning, okay? And this alopecia happens in, 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 uh, in both uh, men and women. Typically, generally speaking, it happens at uh, the age of 40. Now, this uh, can happen for a handful of reasons, okay? Alopecia or hair thinning, again, uh, lack of nutrition or a good nutrition is one of them. Uh, in addition to that, uh, aging is another. Uh, also, stress. Stress will affect... Uh, uh, hair growth as well uh, you know it, it can cost uh, thinning of the hair too now baldness okay uh, true baldness is genetically determined and it's also a sex influence condition uh, there is male pattern baldness okay and it's caused by follicular response to uh, dihydrotestosterone so there's a handful of medications that block, block this dihydrotestosterone and you know so when you look at uh, a lot of these uh uh, some of these products that they sell, you know, uh, uh, in the back of these magazines, uh, they, they, they uh, uh, you know, they promise to, you know, regrow hair uh, by blocking DHT or, you know, I don't know what they claim. Uh, do, some, do they work? I have no idea. They might work for a handful of reasons, but uh, for a handful of people, uh, but I, I don't think they, they, they're quite effective. Uh, there really is no cure for, for baldness at this point. Uh, you have to do, well, what people do is uh, they do get surgery. So when you look at hair transplants, that's how you, how you deal with the uh, male pattern bald, uh, baldness. Uh, the stuff that you spray on your head, you know, like these uh, uh, minoxidil, for example, that uh, people use. All that, essentially what that is, is it's a vasodilator. So uh, they're just increasing the blood supply to the scalp. So they're thinking if you increase the, the blood supply to the scalp, you'll end up getting more hair growth. Again, it works for some people. It doesn't work for others that well. Uh, so hair th thinning can be uh, induced by several factors. Again, I told you stress. Stress can cause that. Uh, high fever can do that. Surgery will do that. Uh, again, drugs like antidepressants, blood th thinners, uh, steroids. And again, people that have cancers and they're, they're receiving a, a chemo, they're getting chemotherapy. Uh, this will also uh, uh, lead to hair loss. Uh, now, there's a condition called alopecia areata. This is when your immune system, it's an autoimmune disorder, your immune system goes and attacks its hair follicles. Uh, some hair loss is re reversible, but uh, others, like when that, when you get, uh, you know, burned by, uh, uh, you know, you get fire burn, heat burn, or from radiation, that's permanent, okay, uh, damage. Because, you know, you end up destroying the entire, uh, the, 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 the root, the hair follicles, everything is completely destroyed. So there's no more uh, cells to regrow at that point. Now, they are working on cloning also, so I don't know, there might be something, uh, you know, in, in the near, maybe you might see that within the next 10 to 15 years. So, nails, uh, it's a, they're scale-like modifications of the epidermis that contain hard keratin. So, just like in hair, just like in, in, in your, your epidermis, they both contain keratin. But, again, it's the hardness of the keratin that's different from each one of these structures. Uh, and it protects, uh, it acts as a protective cover for the distal, dorsal, and surface uh, of fingers and your toes. Uh, it's made up of free edge, uh, a nail plate, and a root. The nail bed, this is epidermis that's underneath those keratinized, that's underneath the keratinized nail plate. The matrix, or the nail matrix, 
it's a thickened part of uh, part of the of the bed that's responsible for uh, the nail growth. You have also nail folds. So the nail folds, this is skin folds that overlaps the border of the nail. There's also something called an epinychium. Uh, this is a nail fold that projects onto the surface of the nail body. This is what you call a cuticle. So when you know you go to the you're, to get a manicure and they're cutting it off your cuticle, they're actually cutting off you know epinychium. That's the the, the medical term for it. There's also a, hyp, a hyponychium, and this is area. This is the part under the edge of the plate that accumulates dirt. Nails normally appear pink because of the capillaries that you find underneath. There's also like a, a white part that's called the lunulae. Uh, this is a thickened uh, nail matrix. Uh, abnormal colors or shapes, they can be indicators of nail disease. So just like in, when we talked about, you know, the skin and the different colors of the, uh, of the skin can tell you a little bit about your health, the shape and color of nails can, can also tell you about what's going on with uh, your body, inside of your body. So let's look at this diagram over here and let's look at all the different parts. So this is the area, this is the hyponychium, okay? And what happens here, this is where you get dirt accumulating, okay, the underside of your, uh, your, your nail. Uh, this is the free edge of your nail, okay? So when you're scratching, you're scratching with your, uh, the, the free edge. This is the nail body over here, okay? Uh, the nail body. And uh, this is the, the epinychium, okay? Or your cuticle. This is the lunulae over here. Uh, what else do we have? Let's see, this is the bone, of course, you got blood, these are the capillaries, so this is what gives the nail the, uh, the pinkish color. So, uh, let's see, uh, this is a proximal nail fold over here, this is the, the root of the, uh, of the nail, and then right over here, guys, this is the matrix, okay, the, 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 the nail matrix, and this is what's causing, this is where the cells are, are present to grow the nail over. And this is the bed, okay, so you have the nail bed and then the nail matrix, matrix that's continuous. Sweat glands are also called sudoriferous glands and uh, they're found on all skin surfaces of your body with the exception of your nipples and parts of the external genitalia. Uh, we have roughly three million sweat glands. Every person out there has got about three million. And there's two main types. Uh, there's ecrine or merequin sweat glands and there's apocrine. Uh, regardless of which type, they both contain, uh, they're made up of myoepithelial cells. And these, and these cells, they contract upon uh, nervous system stimulation. And that forces uh, the sweat into the ducts. Now, why do you sweat? Again, it's for thermoregulation, okay, to, to, to decrease your body heat. Also, in situations where, where you get really scared, for example, or you're getting very nervous, uh, fear, uh, then you'll start sweating also. So think about it, you know, you're about to... Uh, to go up, to, uh, up and give a, a big presentation or a speech, uh, your palms will get really sweaty. Uh, or again, if you're really, really, you know, somebody frightens you, uh, you might start, uh, uh, you know, sweating a lot also. Uh, or if you eat something very spicy, you know, you'll start to sweat also. It's a heat. Uh, it's regulate heat primarily. Uh, so the most numerous uh, type are the ecrine sweat glands. And they're abundant on your palms, the soles, and the forehead. Uh, the ducts, uh, they're connected to the pores. Uh, it functions in thermal regulation, and it's regulated by the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, what is uh, sweat made up of? Well, the secretion is made up of 99% water, salts, vitamin C's, uh, antibodies. Uh, you'll find uh, micro-killing peptides, and then other metabolic wastes are found there as well. So when you look at this picture over here, this is a sweat gland over here, all right? And notice that, you know, the ducts leads to the outside, to the pores, the sweat pores of, of your skin. Uh, so over here, you can see in this uh, 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 this um, uh, uh, this slide, uh, this is the duct over here, and these are the secretory cells, okay, that are producing uh, the, the the product, the sweat. Now the apocrine glands. So apocrine sweat glands. You find these in the axillary region and the, uh, the anal genital area of the body, and they secrete this viscous. Uh, it's a thick, uh, milky or yellowish sweat that contains fats uh, and fatty substances and proteins. Uh, so when these bacteria, they start breaking down uh, the sweat, it's what leads to body odor. Uh, they're much larger than ecrine glands and we have roughly 2,000 of these guys. So they're, again, they're not that, we don't have too many of them. They're much, much uh, 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 less in number than uh, the, the ecrine glands. 
they start functioning at puberty. Uh, what do they function for? We're not sure. But uh, some people think that they may be, uh, they, they may produce, uh, be the equivalent of what animals have uh, as a uh, scent glands. Now we have modified forms of apocrine glands also, and they uh, come in the form of ceruminous uh, uh, glands. And what do they produce? They produce uh, cerumen. Uh, and so you find this lining uh, your external ear, and what do they do? They secrete cerumen. What is cerumen? Cerumen is a fancy word for, or the medical term for, uh, for earwax. Uh, Marimary glands are, all, are also a form of, uh, of these uh, apocrine glands. And what do they produce? They secrete milk. Sebaceous glands are also known as oil glands. You find them throughout your body. Uh, they're widely distributed, ex with the exception of the, the, the thick part of your skin, so your palms and soles. Now, most, they develop from hair follicles and they secrete uh, into the hair follicles. Uh, they're relatively inactive until puberty, so they get stimulated by hormones, especially the male, the, the androgens. They secrete sebum. Sebum is, is again, it's oil. Uh, it's a it's a halogen secretion. So these cells uh, they start to 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 produce uh, the, this oil until they get so full that they just they, they rupture. And then uh, in addition, sebum it also contains uh, this bacteria killing property. So we call that bactericidal. Uh, but this oil, one of the main things that it does, uh, aside from from uh, killing uh, uh, bacteria, certain bacteria, is that it softens hair and skin. It nourishes the skin. And it, again, it helps pr protect a water loss. So here you see, uh, you have the, this uh, hair follicle over here and attached to this hair follicle, you can see this, uh, this, uh, this sweat gland that's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's sweat, this oil gland, this uh, sebaceous gland that's over here. Um, so again, there's another sebaceous gland over here. So as it produces the sebum, the oil, the sebum, it exits through the hair follicle. Now sometimes they end up coming onto the skin without the hair, hair follicle also. Uh, both things will happen. Uh, now whiteheads, these are blocked sebaceous glands. What, uh, that's what white, uh, whiteheads are. Uh, if the secretion oxidizes, the whitehead becomes a blackhead. Uh, acne is usually an infectious inflammation of these oil glands. And then you end up getting these, uh, these uh, pustules that, that, that form and these pustules you know, they're commonly known as pimples. So overactive oil glands, overactive sebaceous glands in infants, that leads to uh, seborrhea, uh, or like a cradle cap. And uh, in adults also, this will lead to uh, uh, dandruff. So um, these overactive sebaceous glands in adults, again, in children you call it cradle cap. So uh, in the cradle cap, it starts off as, as pink, these raised lesions on the scalp, and eventually they turn to yellowish brown and they just flake off. Uh, so here you go. This is an example you see of uh, this cradle cap that you see in, 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 in uh, uh, infants. But they usually, again, will grow out of it. So we're going to be talking uh, more about the function of the skin. Now, as we've been going along th through this chapter so far, we, t we, you know, we mentioned a lot of the, the functions that uh, the skin has. Now we're going to be looking at it in a little bit more detail. Uh, the first thing that you understand, the big picture, is that the skin, it's, well, first of all, it's the largest organ in the body. Because it's the largest organ organ of the body, uh, and again, it's uh, you know it's covering your entire body on the outside. This is the the the, the foremost barrier uh, to protecting your body from uh, an array of things. Uh, so again, when you look at the, the main functions, number one on the list is protection, uh, body temperature regulation. Uh, it uh, provides a, a means uh, for cutaneous sensation for you to feel things, uh, to interact with the outside environment. Uh, it serves many metabolic functions. It has, acts as a blood reservoir, and even it excretes uh, waste from within your body to the outside. Uh, so let's look at the first thing. So the skin, it's exposed to all kinds of microorganisms. Uh, you get injuries, abrasions, uh, temperature extremes, harmful chemicals, uh, and on, uh, again, other substances that could uh, harm the insides of your body. It harms your internal, uh, your tissues, your organs, your cells. So uh, the three barriers constitutes three barriers. Like it has a chemical barrier, a physical barrier, and a biological barrier that it acts as. So the chemical barrier, so what is this, the skin doing? It's secreting chemicals. So we talked about these things, right? One of them is sweat. Sweat, it contains these antimicrobial properties. 
such as uh, the uh, dermcidin. We also talked about the oil glands, the sebaceous glands. Sebum also has bactericidal substances in it. Um, some, of the, some of these cells, they also secrete an antimicrobial called uh, defensins. So all these things, they, when they get onto the surface of the skin, they end up destroying um, uh, microbes that may be present on the skin. It also acts as an acid mantle. So the low pH of the skin, it retards bacterial um, multiplication. The melanin that we have within your epidermis, it again as a barrier against ultraviolet uh, uh, radiation damage to the cells. So think about it. If you have no UV protection, what's going to happen? You will get cancer very quickly. The skin acting as a physical barrier. So these flat, dead, keratinized cells of the stratum corneum. Now remember, there's about 25. They're 25 to 30 cell layers thick. Okay, so they're surrounded by these glycolipids, and it blocks most water and the water soluble substances. So again, this is the, one of the main things. The other thing is some of these chemicals they ha they do have limited penetration of the skin. Now this could be good or bad depending on the substance. So lipid soluble substances they're, they're able to penetrate the skin. Uh, plant ole um, uh, 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 oleoresins they're also able to penetrate which is not a good thing so like poison ivy. Uh, some of these organic solvents, paint thinners and acetones they will also penetrate, penetrate the skin and they'll end up killing a lot of cells so not good. Same thing with some of these salts of heavy metals like lead and mercury. Bad stuff you don't want that. Fortunately some drugs like nitroglycerin they are able to penetrate and they could be life savings. Uh, drug agents, uh, enhancers that help carry other drugs across the skin, uh, they're also able to, some of these are also able to penetrate uh, the, this physical barrier. So the skin, it also acts as a biological barrier. So the epidermis, it contains phagocytic cells. And so when we're talking about these phagocytic cells, we're also talking about these Merkel cells or the dendritic cells of the epidermis. They end up presenting the antigens uh, of the, the, the pathogens to the white blood cells. And so this goes and activates immune response. So the dermis, it also contains macrophages. These macrophages, they end up doing the same thing as far as presenting uh, these, uh, the antigens to the white blood cells. DNA uh, can, all, uh, can absorb harmful UV, UV radiations also and convert it to harmless heat. Now, remember, melanin does a pretty good job as a chemical barrier, but the DNA can do pretty good as well. Body temperature regulation. So under normal resting body temperatures, sweat glands, they produce about a half a liter of unnoticeable sweat. We call this insensible perspiration. Now, if body temperature rises, dilation of dermal vessels, they can increase sweat gland activity to produce roughly three gallons of noticeable sweat. This we call sensible perspiration. And its main job, the reason this happens, is to cool the body down. Now, when the external environment is cold, the opposite will happen. The dermal vessels, they constrict. So when these vessels constrict, what are they doing? They're, uh, they're, uh, they're conserving the heat that's being lost. Okay. So again, when your body is too high, the vessels dilate. You want to get rid of that heat. When it's cold, you want to save the heat. So the vessels will, the opposite happens. The vessels will constrict. They get small. Cutaneous sensory receptors, they're part of the nervous system. So the, these extra receptors, they res respond to stimuli from the outside of the body, such as temperature and touch. These free nerve endings, they are able to sense painful stimuli. So when you look over here in this picture, uh, so again, remember, what do we have here? Let's look at these structures. You have your hair follicle here. You got the, the, the sweat glands, uh, the oil glands that we talked about. You have the sweat glands here. Uh, you have the erector pili muscles here. Now notice that these erector pili muscles, they're also connected to, uh, they, they're getting invaded by these nerve cells. Now when you look over here, uh, these, uh, the, the hair follicles also, uh, uh, innervated uh, by these uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, nerve endings, okay, to, to form this hair root plexus. Um, what else should we look at over here? Uh, you have the pores over here uh, on this end. Um, yeah, you know, we saw this slide before. I don't think there's anything new that we need to look at on, on this end. Metabolic functions of the skin. Skin is able to synthesize vitamin D, and you need vitamin D in order for calcium absorption to take place. Uh, in the intestines. Uh, so what the exposure to sun helps stimulate uh, vitamin C uh, synthesis in the skin. Uh, chemical, now you don't need more, you only need, like I said earlier, you need about 10-15 minutes a day of sun, that's about it. No more than 20 minutes. 
Uh, so if you go about, you know, you, you take a nice 20 minute walk outside, which you should be doing any every way, uh, at least, you know, you should walk about 45 minutes a day. Uh, that's more than enough. And you, you're going to get uh, that sunlight exposure is going to help uh, produce the vitamin D that you need. Now, chemicals from uh, keratinocytes, they can also uh, help to disarm some carcinogens. Uh, keratinocytes, they can also activate some hormones. So, uh, for example, uh, it'll, uh, keratinocytes will convert uh, cortisone into higher cortisone. Skin also makes collagenase, which uh, aids in the natural turnover of collagen, and this helps prevent uh, wrinkling. The skin also acts as a blood reservoir. Uh, it can hold up to 5% of the, uh, the body's total blood volume. Uh, skin vessels, they can be constricted to shunt out the blood to other organs, uh, like when you're exercising, okay, to the muscles. Excretion. So skin can excrete limited amounts of nitrogenous waste, such as ammonia, urea, and uric acid. Uh, sweating can cause salt and water loss as well. Again, so when you're exercising a lot, uh, again, and, and you start to sweat, you know, you end up losing these salts and water. So this is why you need to, uh, to stay hydrated, again, when you're exercising, or again, when it's very hot outside and you're working or you're walking. Uh, because as you sweat, you start losing these salts and water. And uh, this can, uh, you know, if you lose too much, uh, it could lead to death. Skin can develop over 1,000 different conditions and ailments. Lots of things can go wrong with the skin. Uh, fortunately, there's dermatologists that you can go to, and, you know, they can try to help tell you what's going on with, your, with the insides of your body. So a lot of internal diseases... Okay, the very, they will reveal themselves on the outside. Okay, when you look at, notice certain things on the skin, you can find out what's going on on the inside. And we talked about some of these things earlier. If you see somebody's skin's yellow, okay, or the eyes, the whites of their eyes are starting to look yellow, you know what's going on inside their liver. Okay, something's wrong with their liver. Uh, uh, same thing, like uh, if you see, uh, for example, uh, other individuals, uh, that uh, whose skin, okay, it looks very red if they had an injury. And if it's very red and it's swollen, then you know there's an active infe infection uh, going on. And most commonly, a lot of these disorders, they tend to be uh, these infections. Less common but more damaging uh, are burns and skin cancers. So most skin tumors, they are benign. So when something is benign, that means that it's non-cancerous and they don't spread. Uh, when you see metastasize, that means you know it's, the cancer is a, a metas it's spreading, it's a spreadable type of a cancer, it's bad. Uh, metastatic uh, uh, cancers, or malignant cancers, you call them malignant tumors. So malignant tumors, they are the bad tumors, they want to spread. Uh, risk factors, again, too much sun, overexposure to UV radiation, and frequent irritation of the skin. Both these things, they will increase your risk of developing cancers. Uh, some skin lotions, they contain enzymes that can repair damaged skin. Uh, the three major types of skin cancers we find are basal cell carcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas, and melanomas. Uh, this is the worst, the melanoma. The basal cell, this is, you know, it's a skin cancer, so it's bad, but it's not as bad as the melanoma. The one in between is the squamous cell carcinoma. So basal cell carcinoma, this is the least malignant and the most common form of skin cancer. What happens is the stratum basale, they start to proliferate and they start invading the dermis and the hypodermis. Uh, the good thing about it is that, you know, you can cure it quite easily. Uh, you know, when you go to the dermatologist, they'll surgically excise or cut out uh, the, the, the bad tissue. So 99% of the time, this will, you know, simple excision can, can take care of, uh, uh, can cure uh, basal cell carcinoma. So this is an example of a basal cell carcinoma. Now, to an ordinary person, it may look like a, a pimple or a scar uh, mass, but again, to a trained eye, to a dermatologist, they will recognize this as a basal cell carcinoma. So squamous cell carcinoma, this is the second most common type uh, of uh, skin cancer, and this one, it can metastasize. Uh, it involves keratinocytes of the stratum spinosium. Uh, usually, you see this appearing as scaly reddened papules on the scalp, the ears, lower lips, and or, or even the hands. Uh, the prognosis is good. Uh, you know, again, how do they treat it? Uh, it's uh, a lot of the time, again, depending on the dermatologist and depending on, on you know, uh, how much it's spread, it will, it'll be uh, treated either surgically or, again, by radiation. 
And this is an example of a squamous cell carcinoma. Then you have a melanoma. This is the worst type of, uh, and a very dangerous type of a cancer. Uh, this is a cancer of the melanocytes. Uh, it's highly metastatic, meaning it spreads all over the, uh, the body. And it doesn't respond uh, good to chemotherapy either. Uh, it's treated by wide surgical excisions. You have to cut out a lot of tissue. Uh, in addition to that, you need to get immunotherapy. Uh, the key to surviving this type of a cancer is early detection. In other words, A, B, C, D rule. So when what you want to do is you want to look out for uh, lesions. Uh, so like these birthmarks sometimes that you call or these moles. You want to look at asymmetry. So two sides of the pigment area, they don't match. Okay. B, you want to look at the border. If there's irregular border, uh, uh, or you know, you see uh, indentations, that's a sign of concern. Color, you c it, it has lots of shades of colors there, a brown, a black, tan, uh, that's bad news also. And then also you want to look at the diameter. If it's larger than six millimeters, that's not a good sign, it's a bad sign. So when you look over here, notice that you know, it has irregular borders, uh, the color is also, you know, it differs. It's very, first of all, it's a very dark one. Then also it has some areas of lightning, uh, if you look close by. Um, it's larger than six millimeters. Uh, so just by looking at this, you know, again, to a trained eye, you know, this is bad news. This is not good. So this is a melanoma. So when you're talking about burns, this is tissue damage that's either caused by heat. It can also be caused by cold, extreme colds on the, on the other hand. Electricity, radiation, and other uh, and chemicals. So the damage uh, caused by uh, denaturation uh, of uh, proteins ends up destroying the cell. Immediate threat is dehydration and, and electrolyte imbalance. And this will shut down your kidneys and also uh, lead, lead you to go, cause you to go into circulatory shock. Now to evaluate burns, the rule of nine is used. And how this works is this. The body gets broken down to 11 sections. In each section, it represents 9% of the body's surface. The exception is the, are the genitals, which is just 1%. And this helps estimate the volume of fluid that's been lost in the body. So when you look over here at this picture, the, the front and back of the head and neck account for a total of 9%. Uh, your, the front and back part of both limbs uh, account for 18%. The front and back of the, the trunk is 36%. And uh, the front and back uh, of the lower limbs accounts for another 36%. So when you add up, you do the math, that accounts to 100%. Now burns are classified, uh, they're classified by the severity as either being first, second, or third degree burns. Now first degree burns, in this, only the epidermis is damaged. So you end up getting localized redness, you'll get some swelling, and it's, it's painful. Second degree burn, this involves both the epidermis and part of the, uh, the, the, the dermis. So when this happens, you end up seeing blisters and uh, uh, that appear. Uh, both first and second degree burns, they're referred to as partial thickness burns because again, only uh, the epidermis and the part of the upper dermis is involved. So it's partial thickness. Now, when you look at third degree burns, you're getting the entire thickness of the skin that's being damaged. And we call this a full thickness burn. And the skin, it starts changing different colors. It could be uh, a white to a gray or a cherry red or black. There's no swelling seen here and it's not painful because the nerve endings are destroyed also. And you need to have skin grass uh, in order to repair this. Now when you, you look over here, what do you have here? Notice this is the first degree burn. It says redness, okay? Uh, and uh, you look over here, you have uh, swelling to go in, on uh, taking place. So th these are again, you can see the margins are, are you know whether it's first degree burn and then this is the second degree burn over here. Now you look over here. This is third, and this, this has been healing for a while, but you're having a full thickness burn over here. Everything has been gone. Most of the time, when you look at third degree burns, you you, you might end up seeing fat or muscle tissue as well. So burns are considered critical if more than twenty five percent of the body has second degree burns. Uh, or more than 10% of the body has third degree burns. Or on the other hand, if your face, hands, or feet, uh, they're involved in third degree burns. Now, how do you treat th th third degree burns? First thing, one of the things that you have to do is debra debridement. And this is removal of the burned tissue. Antibiotics are also needed. Because remember, you have no first line of defense. Your defense system is gone. Your barrier is gone. 
So anything that's on, on the ear, any pathogen that's in the ear, or anything that you come into contact with, can potentially kill you. So antibiotics are needed. You also need to apply temporary covering, so the form of dressings are, are needed. Also, you're going to need skin grafts. Now skin grafts, they can come from animals or they can come from cadavers. So, uh, development uh, aspects of in, uh, the integral medical system. So, by the end of the fourth month, the, sk the skin's fetus is developed. You have all three layers of the skin. Uh, you can see all the distinct uh, the, the strata there as well. Uh, and then what ends up happening is, around the fifth and sixth month, uh, you start to get a lanugo coat that develops. And this is just like a downy of hair that, that's present. Uh, and uh, th that's uh, on the body. Now, by the seventh month, this coat will start to shed off, this lanugo coat. And then this vernix cassiosa starts to appear. And this is uh, about, it's a sebaceous gland secretion, and it looks like a cheesy layer that, that's on the child. And it's there to protect that fetus uh, from the, the amniotic fluid that the, the, fetus is, or the, embryo, or the fetus is floating in. So uh, from infancy to adulthood, uh, skin thickness uh, starts to take place. So in that, uh, the, that you know, that uh, the fetus and the inf uh, that infant, uh, the skin is very thin. After the baby is born, so you know, after birth, uh, that, uh, that fetus, uh, the skin will start to thicken. More fat is accumulated as well. Sweat and sublacious gland activity, they start to increase uh, too. Uh, now the interesting thing about that, about these two things is, uh, if you live in a very cold environment versus where you live in a warm environment, so if you come from a hot environment, you're going to have a lot more sweat glands that are active, okay, than if you were to living in somewhere cold. Now, the sebaceous gland activity, it ends up leading to acne, and you tend to see uh, acne, uh, again, up into your 30s to some age, but, you know, it, it, during the 20s, you, you'll see them also in your teen years, up into, into your 20s. Uh, after age 30, you start to see a lot of the damage that, that's taking place to your skin. Uh, so that could be damage from an array of things, okay? Sun damage being the number one thing, chemical damage, etc., etc. Also, your skin starts to scale to, 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 uh, towards this part. Uh, dermatitis becomes more common as well. You're, uh, when we talk about scaling, you're talking about drying of the skin that starts to take place. By the time you've aged, okay? So aging skin. The epidermal replacement slows down. Uh, skin becomes thin. So now, before, remember, after you're born, when you're inside your, the womb, it's thin skin. After you're born, it starts to thicken up and it stays thin uh, up until your, your 30s or so. After your 30s, when you start going to your 40s and 50s, everything is downhill from that point on. Uh, the skin becomes thin, it dries up, it becomes itchy also because of that, because you have decreased oil that's being produced. Your oil glands are not very active anymore. Uh, the subcutaneous fat and elasticity decreases as well. Now, this leads to cold intolerance to you. Okay, so older people, they have less amounts of fat, so they, they, they feel cold uh, um, uh, easier, especially among the men. Wrinkling occurs also. Uh, increased risk of cancer due to decreased number of melanocytes that you have and the dendritic cell. Hair starts to thin out also. So how do you delay aging? Well, the very first thing is you need to protect yourself from the sun. No sun, you cannot go outside and under the sun, no bathe, sunbathing. Uh, you have to apply, especially if you're light, you know, you're, you're light skinned, you have to apply uh, sunblock on your face. I'm not talking about sunscreen, but sunblock. There's a big difference between sunscreen and sunblock. Sunscreen, it's kind of like the screen you have in the window, okay? When you open your window up and uh, you have a screen there, it, you know, lets the air in, but you know, it keeps most of the, the, the bugs out. But the very, very small bugs and stuff, they can get in and then the wind comes in. Same thing with the sunscreen. It lets a lot of, uh, not a lot, but it lets uh, enough of the, uh, the UV rays to, 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 to come, you know, to, to come in and damage your, your skin cells. Sunblock is much better. So you should be using sunblock, something with a high SPF uh, uh, rating. And also you need to apply it uh, frequently. So, you know, you can't just put it on, you know, when you first get to the beach or, you know, wherever you are and then, you know, not put it on for the rest. You should be putting it on anywhere from every half hour to an hour, especially if you're going to the water. 
nutrition, you need to eat good. And we're not talking about stuff from, you know, uh, your, the, your, the popular restaurants and packaged foods. We're talking about uh, whole uh, vegetables and fruits, things that don't come in a package. Uh, you need to have a wide arrangement of a, a wide variety of vegetables and fruits also. Uh, you need to drink lots of fluids uh, and have good hygiene also. All these things will help delay aging. So uh, that's it for this chapter in dermatology. Again, if you liked it, please give, please give the, the video a thumbs up. If you have any questions, please leave uh, them in the comments below. You can email me directly. And again, if you want an exam review, please uh, let me know, email me, or leave it in the comments below. Uh, please share it with your friends also if you like this video. Thank you again, and good luck.